All right, it is kind of mid-April, um, and I've read Macbeth, William Shakespeare. Um, I think I read it twice, and then I watched the Ian McKellen, Judy Dench version from the 70s, I think, along with it. Um, I just gotta say, I don't, this, this is, I, I just got nothing from it from where I am now. Um, I don't know if that is just my pure reactional take of just not getting why this place is supposed to be interesting or if it's more so just a where I'm at in this semester and just being tired. Um, so that's that. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy Macbeth um, in, in terms of all the Shakespeare plays we've read so far, or yeah, I would probably put this at the bottom. Um, but I think that 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 more so has to do with the fact that of where 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 I am in the semester right now, uh, with only two weeks left before finals and just being, ugh. Um, I guess the big thing from from Macbeth, right? It's it's mostly taught through this lens of greed and envy and what that does to a person which I get to an extent but like there's just so much of it that I, I don't I don't agree with can, calling it greed like um we you have the whole situation in which you have Macbeth getting told the prophecy that he will become the thane of whatever, and then he will become king. That's the prophecy that was told to him by the witches. Also in that prophecy, um, Banquo gets told that he will not be king, but his sons will be kings. Important to note. And so, you get to this point in which um, you know, like the scene or two scenes immediately after after this prophecy is told, um, Macbeth and Banquo are present for Duncan telling who's going to be his heir, and he names Malcolm, right? And so. You're, you're in this weird spot in which now you're having to deal with this as Macbeth. Well, he didn't name you Macbeth the heir, but the first part of the prophecy has already come true, and therefore there has to be a way for the second part to come true. And so there's greed there in the sense that the, the desire to fulfill the prophecy immediately instead of waiting things out, right? Because there is no, there, there's almost no conceivable world in which your kingdom would go from Duncan to Malcolm and then back up to Macbeth. And so, in order for the prophecy to be fulfilled, Macbeth has to interrupt it in some way. Um, but even with that, right, the heir has already been named. So I've never, I, I, I've never quite understood why Malcolm decides to leave and why Macbeth gets put into into kingdom and into being the king. 
I've never un quite understood that other than this this make believe possibility uh, of of Malcolm saying, "Well, Macbeth is just gonna kill everyone until he's king." So I guess, I guess that's the reasoning. But do, I'd like, there's something there that does not make sense to me, which is really kind of the whole, cr like the whole crutch of Macbeth is that Macbeth becomes king and like Malcolm's already been named as the heir so I like it doesn't there's something there that's not computing for me um and then even even when you look at Macbeth right Macbeth does the deed of of murdering Duncan and then immediately regrets it now, is that greed? Right, or, because I would, I would argue that, that for something to be greed, you then also have to enjoy what you have. And, and Macbeth never has that. He, he, he commits murder, he commits regicide, kills Duncan, gets put into power and then hates every second of it and is paranoid every second that he's in power. And, and so I have to ask, is that really, is that really greed? Um, or is that some, something else, right? Um, so yeah, there's that. <laughs> really, I would argue the, the greediest person is one of the people that we're s supposed to see as one of the good guys, which is Banquo, right? And it's because Banquo is prophesized that, that his children will become kings, right? And that he also hears the, the point that Macbeth will become a king. Banquo is present for the naming of the heir of Malcolm, right? So Banquo knows all of this information. He knows that the the prophecy of uh, Macbeth becoming Thane has come true. He's also been present for the telling of the prophecy that Macbeth will become king. He's also been present for the prophecy that his children will become kings. He's also been present for the naming of Malcolm as the heir. And then following that, right, like you put all four of those together. And I would argue the only logical conclusion that can be made is that, well, now Macbeth is going to try to kill the king in order to fulfill these prophecies. If you know all these prophecies that are supposed to come true and that Macbeth believes in, that's your only logical conclusion that you can make is that Macbeth is going to try to disrupt the order and therefore become king. But Banquo does the exact opposite. Banquo actually encourages the king to go and stay at Macbeth's house. I don't, I think it's what, act, maybe act two, scene one? Um, no, it's, at Act 1, Scene 6, Banquo's actually encouraging the king to go see and, and stay with Macbeth, and gives, gives no mention to the king of this prophecy. Gives, gives no mention that, hey, Macbeth might be a little upset that you didn't name, it, name him your heir. Gives, gives, gives no mention of any of this, right? And I would argue it's because Banquo is being the greediest person here. It's because Banquo realizes and knows that in order for his children to become kings, Macbeth has to become king first. 
And so he's going to let this play out without saying anything, right? Banquo was the real reason all this fucking happened. Um, yeah, like, like, but Banquo is somehow also the good guy in all of this. Um, yeah, yeah, I, you know, it's just one of those things where, like, I, and then, you know, the, just the the way that I think I've conceptualized Macbeth, it just does not match up with the general conceptualization of it, and therefore I feel like I'm at a loss, and I, I don't understand why. Um, but yeah. Although, the one good thing about Macbeth, I will say, is that it has the, perhaps the greatest line um which is i think where the awin line in the return of the king comes from um which is the the whole prophecy that macbeth is told later on which is uh you will not what something along the lines of you will not be slain by man man or woman born of a woman something of that um and the Macduff comes along. Macduff comes along and says, um, "On something, something, something." Macduff was untimely ripped from his mother's womb. Uh, so a cesarean, baby, right? Um, and it's perhaps one of these these this, this greatest moment of triumph. In a, in a story like one line uh kind of gotcha moments um and I, th I i believe it's it's where eowyn it's where the line for eowyn return of the king comes from where uh the black rider is says uh no no man shall kill me and then she takes off her helmet and eowyn says uh something along the lines of, for I am no man, yada, 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 right? Um, so that's a cool line. That's a fun, that's a fun thing. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. I, I just didn't get really anything from this. Um, I guess more like elocution and perlocution, which is the difference difference between the direct meaning of what we say and saying what we mean versus how we say things when certain people are around. I think there's like some paper from the 70s or 80s maybe that really did a deep dive on how Macbeth speaks when he's in public versus when he's in private and how that, there's a difference there, um, especially in the meter, I think. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I just don't really get anything from Macbeth, I'll be honest. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on Macbeth.